I read a story uh, about two little mischievous boys, uh, ages 8 and 10. Uh, they were always getting into trouble. Um, and their parents knew that if any mischief occurred in the town, it, it was probably their fault. And they would probably get blamed for it. Um, so, so not knowing where to turn, their mother turned to the pastor, to her pastor. She asked him to come uh, to, to her home and, and talk with them and maybe remind them that, that God is everywhere and God sees everything and they can't get away with anything like they thought that they could do. Um, so the pastor came to her home and sat down with the younger boy first and their mother and asked the boy, where's God? The boy immediately looked very concerned, but he, he made no response. So the pastor repeated the question, where is God? Uh, again, the boy made no attempt to answer. The boys, so the boy's mom spoke up and, and asked sternly, boy, your, your, boy, your pastor asked you a question. Where is God? And the boy responded, I don't know. Ask my brother. And he, bo he bolted out of the room and ran to his brother's room. Um, when his old brother saw that he came in upset, he asked him what happened. The younger brother, gasping for breath, re re replied, I oh, mean, you're in big trouble this time. God is missing, and they think that you did it. To be honest, maybe you're like me too, I don't know. But to be honest, I, I secretly get a little satisfaction out of blaming others or pointing out the fail failures of others. I'm not proud of it. But when I can point out that somebody else messed up, that kind of makes me feel a little bit good because that means that I didn't do that, whatever, whatever it was. Um, if you're honest, you might find that this is true of you also. I, I think we can, I think when we point out the faults of others, we think in our pride, I ain't so bad because they're obviously worse. But for the past two weeks, we've seen from the book of Romans that God's wrath is rightly upon all people. Because no one is without excuse before God. God is righteous and holy, and we've all sinned against him in various ways. So God would be perfectly just to allow all of us to, to perish and spend eternity in hell. Now, because of that, we might all fall into despair. Since we're all sinners and God punishes sin, we might all start to fear that we're all beyond hope and that there's nothing that we can do in order to go to heaven. And we'd actually be true, be right about a lot of that. There's nothing we can do. But our passage this morning is all about how even though all the world, all nations are in danger of perishing in hell because there's nothing we can do, God himself did something. He sent Jesus. Jesus did what we could not do. So that we could spend eternity with him forever in heaven. That's the gospel. In short, we sin, but Jesus saves that's the point of our scripture passage today also. We sin, but Jesus saves. So let's begin reading with Romans chapter 2, starting in verse 12. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires... They are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secret of the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Father, you see us completely. We can't have any secrets hidden from you. You see us completely with all of our sins all of our pains. And you love us anyway. So help us to trust you in your love. Help us to trust in Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have you ever accidentally done something that um, worked out perfectly, even though it could have ended in disaster? 
Uh, a few years back, we were driving home from Chicago, I think. Um, and I really should have gotten gas before we left the city, but I didn't. Um, I, I didn't. I, I didn't think about doing what I should have done. <laughs> I just did what I wanted to do. I wanted to get on the road. I wanted to get home as fast as possible. Um, and before I knew it, the car was telling me that I was low on gas. And we were in the middle of nowhere. And, and then the fuel estimate in the car let me know that there were zero miles to empty. Zero, I took a picture of it. Zero miles to empty. Um, and I rode on that uh, for about the next five or ten miles or so. Because there was no gas station. We were in the middle of nowhere. We were driving on zero but by God's grace alone, I was able to make it to a gas station to fill up. That could have ended in disaster, right? I could have run out of gas with nowhere to go. I had to walk. Maybe that's happened to one of you. I've heard stories of my parents saying that they have run out of gas and to walk. Yeah? Or maybe, just like my dad, that you were running on empty and it didn't work out so well for you. Um, that's what happens when you trust your gut, right? <laughs> Sometimes it works out. You're able to make it to a gas station on fumes. Sometimes it doesn't. It's interesting that in our passage this morning, Paul goes on this tangent about how Gentiles, that's us, uh, possibly being able to obey the Old Testament law, do what the law, Old Testament law requires, even though they didn't read or respect the Old Testament law. Um, they weren't aware of what God wanted them to do, and, and even if they were, they, they didn't care. Uh, so my initial reaction to all this is to say, Paul, I think you're wrong. G Gentiles couldn't be any more perfect than the Jews could be perfect. Uh, everything we've read in the book of Romans up now emphasizes this truth that we've all sinned and we're all equally in danger of God's wrath. So how can Gentiles just do that naturally? But I think what Paul is trying to teach us here is that whether or not we read the Old Testament law, whether or not we read the Bible, is in a way, irrelevant. It doesn't matter whether or not you know the law. It matters whether or not you pay the law. So let's say you go out this afternoon. Uh, you get on route, route 16 toward Pena, going home, and you drive 95 miles an hour, okay? And a cop pulls you over. And you say to the police officer, I'm, I'm sorry, officer. I didn't know what the speed limit was. What's it going to tell you? Yeah, ignorance is no excuse, right? Um, I think he would he would definitely say um, something like, well, you didn't know what the speed limit wa was, but you know you shouldn't have gone 95 miles an hour, right? We all would kind of know that. Now, let's say you're driving on Route 16, and, and you don't know what the speed limit is, but you drive 55 miles an hour because that just feels right. It feels right. Are you going to get pulled over? No. That's the speed limit. It, because even though you didn't know the speed limit, you naturally went the speed limit. I'm not going to pull you over for that. That's kind of what, like, what Paul is saying in this passage. He's saying that Gentiles, even though they don't read the Old Testament, will either be accused or excused on the day of judgment. We all have a conscience. And that conscience, while not perfect because of our sin, is definitely influenced by God's absolute moral truth because we're all made in the image of God. God instills that in us, that, that, that code of morality. So we, so we know th certain things are wrong. We know murder is wrong. We, we know that rape is wrong. We, we know that loving one another is right. Even if we don't read the Bible... We know these things. Now, please hear me. I'm not saying that we should just live however we feel like living and, and just hope that we stumble on the right things. That's not what I'm saying. And I'm not saying it's not important to read the Bible. It's extremely important because that's how we know with more certainty what God wants us to do and believe. And even more than that, it's how we know the gospel, how God saves us when we fail to do what he wants us to do. I'm just saying, I'm not saying that, whatever that is. Um, I'm just saying that when it comes to the passage, this passage in Romans, Paul is clear that whether or not you look to the law, the Old Testament, or, or even to the Bible as a whole, as your moral guide, the Bible is clear that we're all condemned to perish. Uh, 
Um, he, he wrote in verse 12, For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who sinned under law will be judged by the law. So the simple truth is that uh, we've proven by our lives, whether or not we even read the Bible, that we're all deserving of death and hell. We can't possibly do enough good to undo that. That's what we've been talking about this last couple of weeks. Um, I don't know if it's true or not, but I read a story about a convict who escaped from uh, Albany Penitentiary, penitentiary in, in New York. After uh, years of searching for him, the detective that was assigned to his case finally tracked him down and caught up with him in a, in a drugstore in California. Uh, as the escaped convict uh, began to make his, his purchase and buy his, what, he, what he picked out at the store, the, the detective walked up behind him, uh, laid his hand on his shoulder, the man's shoulder, and said, you're under arrest, you're under arrest, come with me. Appearing stunned, uh, the, the man said to the detective, well, what did I do? Um, I've been a law-abiding citizen for years. What did I do? Uh, the detective calmly replied, you know what you did. You escaped from the Albany Penitentiary several years ago. You went west, got married, and came here to live, thinking that you could start a new life. But I found you. Quietly, the man admitted, that's true. But I've changed. I haven't broken a law in all these years, and, and, and now I have a family who will be very confused if, they just, if I just disappear. So, so before you take me in, could, could I at least stop by my house to talk with my family? And against his better judgment, the detective agreed. So they got to his home. The man looked at his wife and said, haven't I been a kind husband and a good father? Haven't I worked hard to make a living? Uh, have I done anything deserving of jail or, 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 or punishment? And his wife answered, of course, of course not. You, you've been the perfect husband, the perfect father. Why, why are you asking me these questions? And the detective then explained what had happened and how her husband was now under arrest. Apparently, the escaped convict had hoped that his, his record uh, of being the perfect husband, the perfect father would impress the detective and he would be let go. But even though he was right with his family, he was still wrong with the state of New York. The truth is, no matter how, how good how much good we do. We've all already broken God's law. And we can only be saved by God's grace. You see, one of the biggest problems with how people usually think about Christianity is that we think it's primarily about how good we live. Many people think Christianity is about living like a goody two-shoes or um, going to church or, or giving money to church, but that's not what Christianity is all about. Christianity is about recognizing how we've all messed up big time in all of these areas and so many more, and how Jesus came down from heaven to rescue us. Christianity is not about what we do, but about what Jesus has done for us. And if we make it about what we do or what we have done, we've missed the point. And that applies to every single one of us, even the people that you look up to the most. Now look at verse 17. But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law, and if you are sure that you, you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor, a teacher of children, having, the law, uh, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, uh, all, all these good things, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. So in these verses, Paul is pointing out that even those of us who teach God's law are still guilty of breaking it. I think this is what is often left out or, or miscommunicated when, it, when we share our faith with others. It's why so many people think Christian, uh, Christians are judgmental. And I think we, we sometimes fail to share it because we conveniently forget that it's true. Rather than acknowledging when we're sharing the gospel that we're in the same boat as those that we disagree with, or, or even not even while we're sharing the gospel, just in, in, in life in general, we kind of look down on others. We, we'd rather think that we're just slightly better than them. I've heard this many times over the years. When we're talking about certain sins, I hear Christians say, I'd never do that. 
and they say it with this look of disgust on their face. face. Uh, I'd, I'd never do that. And what they're subtly saying is, I, I'm better than the people who do that. And when I say they, I mean, I mean, I mean we. Because even if you don't say those words, we've all had those thoughts. But maybe not, maybe right now you're thinking, Pastor, I'd never do that. I encourage you just to think about that for one second. So when I preach against sin, I'm not at all saying that I'm not a sinner. As your pastor, when I instruct you to live a certain way according to God's word, I'm not at all saying that I do that perfectly or even better than any of you. I'm simply pointing all of us to the standard that God himself has set for us. And it's true that we're to point others to live by that standard also. We are to be a guide to those who are blind. We are to be a light to those who are in darkness because we've seen the light of Jesus and we want to shine that light wherever we go. We want others to see Jesus in us so that they would lay down their own pride receive Jesus. Because without Jesus, all our good works can't possibly outweigh the sins that we've already committed. So we need to point people to Jesus with love and humility, not by thinking that we're somehow better than them. Verse 25, for circumcision indeed is of some value if you obey the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So, if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the have written code in circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. Now, I've kind of danced around this subject in the past because it's a little uncomfortable for a guy to talk about. But, but circumcision, of course, is the medical procedure performed on baby boys. W- without getting too graphic, it's the cutting off of part of his flesh. And while circumcision has certain health benefits, such as lower risks of urinary tract infections, it's, it's an elective procedure because most doctors agree that it's not absolutely necessary with modern sanitary practices. But all that aside, in this context, it's used as the symbol of obeying the law. Circumcision was the sign of attempting to obey all of God's law, all of God's law, because really a man would only get circumcised if they were really, and I mean really, committed to God. Or at least wanting to prove to themselves and to God that they were. In the church today, a similar symbol would be baptism. A lot of people think baptism is what gets you to heaven, but the Bible is clear that it's only a symbol. It's very, it's a very important symbol, which illustrates how we're reborn as new creations and our sins are washed away, and yet it's still just a symbol. Baptism can't save us. Trying really hard to obey all of God's law can't save us because we've already sinned. We can't take that back. And ignorance of the law isn't a defense. We're all guilty, and the sentence is death. So what are we going to do about this? What do we do with the knowledge that we're all perishing, that we're all dying? The simple answer is this. Get circumcised. Not of the flesh, but of the spirit as it says in verse 29, but a Jew is one inwardly and circumcision circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. In other words, allow God to cut away that which is the most, uh, uh, that, that which hurts you the most, your pride, your striving. Anything and everything that tempts you to make life all about you, because life is not about you. It's about God. So give glory to God. This is why Jesus went to the cross. Uh, cross. A lot of people criticize God's method for forgiving sins, but, but Jesus went to the cross in part to show you just how much we messed up. We messed up so much 
that the only way God saw fit to forgive us was for Jesus, the Son of God, and God in flesh to die in our place. Admit that. So if I were to sum up today's message in one sentence, it would be this. All of us have sinned, and the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And if I were to sum up today's message in just five words, it's the same five words I used to sum up the gospel. We sin, but Jesus saves.